Good morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we dive into the word this morning. Father, we come before you. And Lord, we just humbly cry out and say we need you to speak to us today. Father, I thank you for these who have gathered here to worship you and to praise you and to hear your word. Father, while the world around us is out hustling, busy with their day, we, these who love you, have decided to come and just await in your presence. Father, while some sleep and slumber in their beds, even at this late hour in the day, after a long, hard week at work, Lord, these who are here in the room have decided to come and lift their hands and their voices in worship. Father, while some are out shopping, getting their chores and things checked off their to-do list, Lord, we are here to listen and to hear from you. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would bless this time. We long for you. We love you. We desire to be closer to you. Thank you for being here with us. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I already know the answer to the question I'm about to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway, just to make sure you're listening, okay? So this is just a, a warm-up question. I want you to raise your hand if you personally eat food. Okay, good. Y'all are all listening. So far, nobody's fallen asleep yet. That's a good sign. That's what I thought. We all eat food, right? Now, thinking about that, that we all eat food... I bet we all eat differently, though, don't we? We probably all eat different amounts of food. We probably all eat different kinds of food or prefer different kinds of food. Um, we eat at different times of the day. When it comes to eating, we all do it differently, but we all do it, don't we? I want to see how brave you are now. Y'all got your brave faces on? You ready? I'm going to ask you some questions and... This is going to require a little courage on your part, but let me just remind you, let me remind us all that the Bible tells us to not judge. <laughs> Remember what Jesus said. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, he said, do not judge so that you won't be judged. For you will be judged by the same standard in which you judge others, and you will be measured by the same measure you use. Okay? So everybody got the reminder? Don't judge. Don't judge. No judgment. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ here. So let me ask you this. Show of hands, how many of you eat a diet or prefer a diet that primarily consists of red meat? Raise your hand. Okay? Quite a few of you. How many of you prefer a diet that primarily consists of white meat? Okay? See, I see, I saw it. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not here. Be brave. It's okay. No judgment. Anybody here gluten free? A couple of you. There's more of you. Y'all just didn't want to raise your hand. It's, it's fine. You can be honest. There's no judgment here. Anybody here eat way too many carbs? Quite a few of you. Okay, this is the really brave one. We didn't have a single person in the first service brave enough to raise their hand on this. Do we have any vegetarians in God's house this morning? Anybody? <laughs> no, not at Cowboy Church. They're like, mm -mm. they ain't going to let me get out of the parking lot. I won't be able to come back here if I raise my hand to that question. You cannot tell me in a church this size we don't have one vegetarian. It's okay. We love you wherever you are. We love you. No judgment. How many of you eat one time a day? How many of you eat two times a day? Okay. How many of you eat three times a day? Put two hands up if you eat way too many times a day. That's what I thought. We can tell. We, we can tell. You didn't even have to raise your hand. I, I had mine up too. I had mine up too. You can tell. Here's the point. Here's the point. This is why I do this. This is what I want you to see. When it comes to eating, we all do it a little different. We all eat a little different. We all eat at different times. We all eat different amounts. We all do it a little different. But when it comes to eating, we all do it. We all eat. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's right. He's right. 
No doubt about it, we all eat. I did a search in my Bible program, and I discovered that the Gospels record Jesus Christ sharing a meal with people no fewer than a dozen times. It's more than that, more than likely, but direct quotes where we can say without a shadow of a doubt, it's a little over a dozen. For example, in Matthew chapter 10, in Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 10, we see Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 6 and 7, we find Jesus at Simon the leopard's house sharing a meal. In Matthew 26, we see Jesus with the disciples at the Last Supper. We're going to read that text together a little later in the message. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus is eating at Levi's house. In Luke chapter 7, he's eating at the home of a Pharisee. In Luke chapter 10, he's at the home of Mary and Martha sharing a meal. And we know it's high likelihood that he did that multiple times at their home. In Luke chapter 11, and again in Luke chapter 14, we see Jesus again dining with Pharisees, people who, who were trying to trap him and trick him and test him. And, but there he was at the table with them. In Luke chapter 19, he's at a meal with a guy by the name of Zacchaeus. You might remember Zacchaeus. He was the little bitty man who was up in the tree. In John 21, Jesus is next to the Sea of Galilee preparing breakfast for the disciples after his resurrection from the dead. There are more, but you get the point. Jesus spent time at the table with people. Even more evidence can be found if you go through and read through the Acts of the Apostles, for example, the book of Acts. You'll read and discover that the early church, the earliest Christians, all ate food too. And many times ate food together. They made it a point to eat with one another. Eating is a big part of our lives. It always has been and it always will be. We've always all done it a little different, but we've always all done it. Everyone eats. Think about that for a minute. You might be going, well, what's the big deal? So what? Everybody eats. I get it. Now, let me say it like this. Not everyone you know likes football. I know, it's a surprise, but it's true. Not everybody you know likes rodeo. Not everybody you know likes Taylor Swift. I'm going to say this, remember, no judgment, and this is not my personal opinion. I'm just, going to, I'm just trying to make a point here, okay? No booing me. Not everybody you know likes George Strait. I know. It's, I'm glad y'all are sitting down. Don't leave. This, it gets better, okay? Hold on. Just, I'm just making a point. It's not my opinion. Just, just making a point. Not everybody you know is married, not everybody you know has kids. Not everybody you know enjoys traveling. In fact, there are a lot of people that would just as soon never leave Atascosa County. Not everybody you know likes computers. Not everybody you know enjoys and spends their life on social media. Not everybody you know owns a house. Not everybody you know goes to church or calls Jesus their Lord and Savior. But every single person you know eats. So if we all eat, and if every single person we know eats, shouldn't we, as disciples of Jesus, leverage that for the gospel? Of course we should. In the book, Surprise the World, Michael uh, Foster talks about and challenges us to eat with at least three people a week. Three people who aren't a part of our family. Three people that we intentionally meet with to bless and to get to know. Here's a really powerful point on page 53. If you have the book or if you're in the small groups and you've been reading this book with us, on page 53 he makes this incredible point. He says, conversion flowered from communion, talking about the early church and how they won people to Jesus. Conversion flowered from communion. I really like that. I really like that. And just like you, I want everybody I know who is lost, I want them to come to know Jesus. 
I want them to be saved by the blood of Jesus. I don't think we should go and eat with people. And by the way, the author of this study doesn't either. He, and he makes this point in his text. He, he says we shouldn't go and eat with people for the sole intention of converting them. That's not our, that's not our goal. Or it can be our goal, but it's not our intention. What he's actually saying in his book is, is that we should come and genuinely, sincerely just want to share the table with people. Because such powerful things happen at the table. I want to make it very clear here in this message that yes, I want to challenge you to eat with people, but I want to challenge you to eat with them just because your heart cares about them. And then let God do whatever he's going to do at the table. Here's our big idea for today. I want to take, take uh, the author's point and I want to just make it our own by tweaking it a little bit. Here's what I want you to get today before you leave. I want you to understand this. Connection flows from communion. If we want to connect with people, be it our family, friends, co-workers, strangers, whatever it is, there has to be some form of communion between us. Connection flows from communion. Our heart and our desire should be to form deep, meaningful, sincere, genuine relationships and connections with people. And that flows from communion with people. One of the easiest and most natural ways to commune with people and to connect with people is by spending time with them at the table, to eat with them. I want to give you four specific reasons why you should take this challenge to eat with three people a week. Just like last week we talked about blessing three people, it's not for one week. We're supposed to be intentional and do that every week. Bless three people and then eat with three people. This is our second habit. The first reason I would encourage you to do this is because in doing this, you are following Christ's example. Eating with people and spending time at the table with people follows the example of Jesus. Now, there's a lot we could say here, but I'm not going to say a whole much because I, I, I want to spend more time on some of these other points. bunch of verses we could read here, but I just mentioned nine different verses a moment ago and passages a moment ago that, that showed Jesus doing this throughout his ministry. So for the sake of time, we're not going to do a deep dive here. We're just going to make a quick point and move on. But I do want you to understand that when we come to the table, when we share a meal with people, whether that's our family, strangers, a friend, whether that's a saved person or a lost person or any other person, when we come to the table and spend time at the table with other people, we are following the example of Jesus. That is, if we are intentional with that time. If we make that time, and if we redeem that time, and if we're wise with that time. Besides following the example of Jesus, there's something else that happens whenever we come to the table. Point number two is this, it fosters fellowship with one another. When we come to the table with people, it fosters fellowship. There's just something special about eating with people. Eating with other people generally draws us closer together. Now, I know you're probably going to say, I remember we had a pretty good fight at that table, too. <laughs> had a big disagreement at that table. Sure, sure you did. But generally, eating together draws us closer together. This is why it's so important that we eat together as families. I know it's hard. I know our culture is weird. I know it's easy to get sucked into the trap of being so busy that we never sit down at the table and eat together as a family. It's something even our family has to be very intentional about and try very hard with. But I want to encourage you, mom and dad, make that a time that, that's intentional for you and your family. Eat at the table as much as you can. Don't have the TV playing over off in the, the, the sidelines. Don't be on your phone or allow the kids to be on theirs. Come to the, to the table together and eat together in fellowship with one another. It's an important time there at the table. It's why we as a church, several times a year, even with a church our size, we make it a point to have opportunities for us to come and eat together in fellowship with one another at the table. If we want to have deeper relationships with people, we eat with them. It's been said that the key to a man's heart is through his stomach. The reality, though, church, is this. That's the key to everybody's heart. Because we all eat. 
This is, this is one of the reasons why small groups, most of them, not all of them, but most of them, almost every single one of them share a meal together each week before or after their time of study. And it's during that meal time that fellowship happens. It's during that meal time that people share testimony about what happened in their week. It's during that meal time that they discover that they have things in common. It's during that meal time that those personal connections happen. And guess what? We're not the first to do this. We're not the first to figure that out. In Acts chapter 2, we see this of the early church. It says, every day, verse 46, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple, and they broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who are being saved. They're getting together every day and they're eating together, breaking bread together. It goes back even further than that. You can go into the Old Testament and you can see how important food was, how important sharing a meal with people was when it came to fostering a fellowship or fostering a relationship with somebody else. There's this passage in Genesis 18, so much we could say about it, but I just want you to see the, the, the part of this where they shared the meal there's this passage in Genesis 18 when some strangers, people Abraham didn't know, show up at the tent of Abraham and Sarah. And I want you to see what the first instinct of Abraham was when these strangers show up at his tent. It says in verse 6 of Genesis 18, Abraham hurried. He got after it. He was quick about this. This was his first instinct. He went into the tent and he said to Sarah, quick, hurry, get after this. Knead three measures of fine flour and make bread. Abraham ran. Again, he's being quick about this. He ran to the herd, and he got a tender choice calf. He gave it to a young man who hurried to prepare it. Then Abraham took curds and milk as well as the calf that had been prepared, and he set them before the men. He served them as they ate under the tree. You know what the lesson in that is? When you don't know what to do, cook some food. When you don't know what they want, give them something to eat. When you're confused about what's happening, put some beans on. Right? It's such a powerful thing, and we, we see people doing this all the way back in Genesis. It's a powerful thing. We, we even see it making a difference in the lives of people who are at odds with each other. People who aren't getting along, people who are enemies. Again, just one example, many examples in Scripture, but one example from way back in Genesis chapter 26. Isaac has been having some trouble with the Philistines. And what the Philistines have been doing is they've been coming along and they've been filling up his father's wells. They've got some water rights issues going on. And it finally gets resolved, and they seal the deal by eating together. In Genesis 26, 28 through 31, it says, They replied, We've clearly seen how the Lord has been with you. We think there should be an oath between the two parties, between us and you. Let us make a covenant with you. You will not harm us, just as we have not harmed you, but have done only what was good to you, sending you away in peace. You are now blessed by the Lord. Look at verse 30. So he prepared a banquet for them, and they ate and drank. They got up early in the morning and swore an oath to one another. Isaac sent them on their way, and they left them in peace. And as far as we know, from this point forward, that peace held throughout the rest of his life. In Acts chapter 16, we see a, a New Testament example of something similar. Paul and Silas had been thrown in jail. They had been beaten. A miracle happened, though, that resulted in their miraculous release. And as a part of that, the jailer, the, the guy who had put them in the shackles becomes a believer. He comes to faith in Jesus Christ. And I want you to see the first thing they did together. It says, he took them that same hour of the night and he washed their wounds. This is the jailer, who is also probably the guy who beat Paul, by the way. He's now washing his wounds. And it says, right away, he and his family were baptized. And then look at this in verse 34. He brought them into his house set a meal before them and rejoiced 
because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. They ate a meal together. That's the power of the gospel. Church, if you want to foster deep, meaningful relationships with people, eat with them. Come to the table and spend time with them. If you care about them, eat with them. If you want them to know they matter, eat with them. If you want them to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, eat with them. Eating together is a powerful, powerful thing. There's a reason why when you're dating somebody, you take them out to eat. How many of y'all have ever been on a date where you ate? So the rest of y'all never been on a date, I'm assuming. It's okay. Maybe one day it'll happen for you. Yeah, you might go do other things on dates, but, but the general thing, the primary thing, the thing we do the most consistently and the most often on a date is we go eat together. And it's not just because we want to see if you're a vegetarian or not, ladies. It's not just because they're trying to figure out if you're one of those loud chewers, men. We, we go and we eat together because that's the easy and natural way to see if this relationship is going anywhere. Because connection, remember, flows from communion. And eating together fosters communion very naturally. If you've ever been on one of those dates, you might have been on one of those dates that wasn't going so well. You might have been on one of those dates that you, you were hoping it was over before the meal was even finished. That leads us to our next point. It facilitates conversation. I just mentioned why we eat together on dates. Um, it's a perfect example of this point as well. We go out to eat because it facilitates conversation with one another. Maybe you've been on one of those dates where the conversation didn't go so well. Maybe there was nothing to talk about. Like you got there and you ordered your food and you did the little small talk thing. And then there was just nothing else to talk about. And you were like, hurry up and bring me my food so this can be over. The ladies are going, amen. Yeah. Or, or maybe the conversation just got weird. Maybe this person just turned out not to be who you thought they were. Or maybe that person just talked way too much. And you never got to talk at all. But whatever it was, you were sitting there and you knew this wasn't going anywhere. When the meal was done, so was your time with this person. Right? Right? In the context of dating, that's a, a good thing because when we eat together, it facilitates a series of conversations that allow us to discover if there's a future for this relationship. If we don't want to share a meal with them, we don't want to share a house with them. If we don't want to share a meal with them, we certainly don't want to share our last name with them. If we don't want to share a meal with someone... We don't want to share the rest of our lives with them, right? See, when people come to the table, these conversations happen in a natural, easy way. It's a great place to talk, the table is. I love this quote from the book. The author, he just nails it. He says this, he says, the table is the great equalizer in a relationship. It's a good point. When we come to the table, we're all equal. The table is a place where meaningful and significant things happen because we're all equal there. I'm just going to share one example from Scripture of this. It comes from Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. It says, Then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. So Jesus gets invited to this guy's house to eat. They want to have a conversation over the table. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And a woman in town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought in an alabaster jar of perfume and she stood behind him at his feet weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with perfume. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, this man, he's talking about Jesus, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who... And what kind of woman this is who's touching him? She's a sinner, exclamation point. 
And then look at what Jesus says. It says, Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. Because everybody's equal at the table. There's a lot going on in this interaction, so much we could say. This is a very serious, deep spiritual discussion that's about to take place. But at the end, the end result is Jesus literally forgives this woman of her sins in front of the Pharisees, blows their mind, really ticks them off. You know, They're like, we invited you to dinner and you come into our house and do this. But that's what he does. That conversation that happened, that conversation between Jesus and the woman, that conversation between Jesus and the Pharisee and the other Pharisees that were there, this lesson that was taught, it was not a result of the food itself. It wasn't a direct result of even the meal, right? It wasn't a conversation that they couldn't have had on the street or somewhere else, but it was facilitated by the table. Church, we shouldn't come to the table with our friends and family and those who don't know or belong to the kingdom of God with some agenda. I said this at the beginning, but I want to make this point clear. We don't come to the table, take our seats, and then launch into our rehearsed presentation, right? We don't whip out our iPad and go, man, I got my PowerPoint all ready here. I know we've ordered our food and you can't leave for 20 or 30 minutes, so I'm going to really give it to you. That's not why we come to the table. But when we sit at the table with others, when we hear their stories, when they hear ours, when we have a conversation with one another, you know what's going to happen? There are going to be opportunities to share the gospel. There are going to be opportunities to encourage and inspire. There are going to be opportunities to speak life into somebody's life who's discouraged. There are going to be opportunities to find common ground where maybe you thought there was none. Because eating with people facilitates communication and conversation. So again, we should do it as often as we can. And once again, remember that connection flows from communion. Here's the fourth thing and the final thing for today. It's another really important thing. I believe spending time at the table forges disciples. It's some of the most intentional and critical and crucial time we can spend with anyone we want to see grow into a disciple of Jesus. The Gospels don't chronicle all the meals that Jesus shared with the disciples during their ministry and travels together. However, I don't think it's much of a stretch to say that they ate together on a bunch of different occasions because we know Jesus ate, we know he was a man in the flesh, we, we, we know he had to eat, that was a part of his physical nature here on earth. We certainly know the apostles ate, right? We see him many times in scripture eating. So it's not too much of a stretch to go, he probably did this a couple of times a day with whoever he was with. We know Jesus lived in the home of Peter for much of the time of his three-year ministry. It's not much of a stretch to say they probably spent some time at Peter's table. We know that they traveled together extensively, Jesus and the disciples. It's not a stretch to say they probably ate along the way because we see them even doing that on occasion in the text. Last week, we talked about the feeding of the 5,000. So obviously, they were all there at that table, even though it was in the grass and Jesus had to do a miracle to get everybody's food. But they were all together and they all ate there and they were all satisfied according to that text. As we said at the very beginning, we all eat. So certainly these guys all ate on multiple occasions every single day. Those meals are likely not recorded because they're such an ordinary, natural, and normal part of life. But there's no doubt in my mind that Jesus answered a lot of questions at a table. There's no doubt in my mind that Jesus did a great deal of teaching with the disciples and others reclined at a table. There's no doubt in my mind that much of the foraging of these men who would become the apostles and the early disciples that would take the message and the hope of the gospel to the world, much of their discipling happened at a table. The table is a great place to forge disciples. The few instances in scripture we have of 
are moments of great significance at tables. Two of them happen after the death of Jesus on the cross. He's buried in a tomb and he, he's resurrected from the dead three days later. And I want you to see what happens on the, the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, 28 through 35. It says, they came near the village where they were going and he gave the impression that he was going further. That was Jesus. But they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour they got up and they returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and those with them gathered together who said, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread at the table. It was there at the table that their eyes were opened. It was there at the table that they recognized Jesus for who he was. That was a super significant moment in their lives, a moment that changed their lives. It was a moment that increased their faith. It was a moment that inspired them to start spreading the good news of the gospel to other people right away. They got up right then and went back to Jerusalem telling everyone that Jesus was alive started at the table. Look at this second example. It's in John 21, 9 through 14. It says, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. It's right after this that Jesus has that awkward, difficult, hard conversation with Peter by asking him three times, do you love me? This was a time of deep conversation, a time of teaching, a time of discipleship, it was a moment that was going to be very impactful, not just to the life of Peter, but to all the disciples. And it started at breakfast at the table. We don't know for sure, but it seems entirely possible that in John chapter 20, when Jesus appears to the disciples in the locked room, there could have been some food there on the table. It seems entirely plausible and possible to me that the whole reason they were in the room was to share a meal together. Scriptures don't tell us, but it seems highly likely that that would have been a primary purpose in their life because we all eat. We know Thomas wasn't there, and I have a theory. This isn't based on any great theological learning. It's certainly not based on anything the Lord has told me. But I have a theory the reason Thomas wasn't there is because he was the one who went to get the fried chicken <laughs> or the pizza for the potluck that night. Because they didn't have DoorDash back then. It hadn't been invented. So somebody actually had to go get it. So that's probably why Thomas wasn't there. We don't know. Again, we don't know. But, but it's a big moment that happens in that room. We do know about this one. We do know about what happened just before Jesus suffered and went through his passion and would die on the cross. We call it the last. And it happened at a... Y'all are catching on. Luke 22... 14 through 15, when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. There in the upper room, Jesus gathers with the disciples one last time and he would talk there at the table. He would disciple them there at the table. He would speak of his suffering to come. He would speak of the new covenant. He would lead them in what we now call the Lord's Supper for the first time and do so much more there that night, including washing their feet and everything else at the table. This is a discipleship moment. The point is the table is a great place 
to forge disciples. If you want to help your children grow and learn to follow Jesus and be a disciple for Jesus, don't waste your time at the table. If you want anybody in your life, co-workers, strangers, neighbors, if you want anybody in your life to come to know Jesus and to grow and learn to live for Jesus, don't waste the time you get with them at the table. Don't just eat with them. Be intentional with that time. Remember, connection flows from communion. Let me close by saying this. Did you know there's a table in heaven? There's some mystery about this table. There's a great deal of uncertainty about this table. There have been books written about this table, but nobody really knows. I mean, there's just mystery around some of this stuff in Scripture. But in Revelation, it it alludes to it. Um, Jesus alludes to this table in eternity. In, In Luke chapter 22, Jesus actually said this about it. He said, I bestow on you a kingdom just as my father bestowed one on me. And then look at verse 30. He said, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Earlier in Luke 13, teaching about eternity and eternal life, Jesus has this conversation starting in verse 23. And remember the context here is eternity and eternal life. Lord, someone asked him, are only a few people going to be saved? It's a pretty good question. Here's Jesus' answer. He says, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because I tell you, many will try to enter and won't be able. Once the homeowner gets up and shuts the door, then you will stand outside and you will knock on the door, saying, Lord, open up for us. He will answer you, I don't know you or where you're from. And then you will say, well, we ate and drank in your presence. And you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I don't know you or where you're from. Get away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in that place. You will see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you yourselves will be thrown out. And then look at this in verse 29. They will come from east and west, from north and south, to share in the banquet in the kingdom of God. Note this, he says, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. People are going to come from all over, north, south, east, and west, every tongue, every tribe, every creed. They're going to come and they're going to feast at the table of God, in the kingdom of God, and share in the banquet of the kingdom. My question is this, are you going to be there at that table? Do you know Jesus? Have you repented, confessed, and believed? Perhaps the better question is, does he know you? Not does he know you exist, of course he does. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows everything about you. I'm not asking, does he know you exist? I'm asking, does he know you? Has he put your name in the Lamb's book of life? As a saved, regenerated, repentant sinner who has come to know his grace and his love and his mercy and accepted it as your own, has he written your name down in that book? Does he know you? Connection flows from communion. Does he know you? God sent Jesus to earth to live, to die, and ultimately to conquer death so you could be connected with him. So you could be returned and restored to a right relationship with him. And so you could have a seat at that table in heaven and share in the banquet of the kingdom of God. If you don't know him, repent, believe, confess, and be saved today. I want to see every single one of you at that table. I love that old hymn, When We All Get to Heaven. It's a great hymn. Nothing wrong with it. But every time we sing that hymn, every time I sing that hymn, you know what I think about? We ain't all going to get there. 
Sadly, there are billions of people in the world, there are people in this room right now who, if they died this very instant, would not be at the table. Our hearts should be for everybody to be there. And if we want them to be at that table, we've got to start spending some time with them at the tables here on this planet. So I ask you again, are you going to be there? If not, I pray you'll repent, confess, and believe this hour. Be saved this day and get your seat at that table in heaven. And if you are saved, I pray you'll take up the challenge and you'll be intentional to bless and eat with three people this week and watch what God will do. Let's pray. If you're here and have not called on Jesus as your Lord and Savior and desire to do so, we don't ask you to come to the front. I'm not going to ask you to raise a hand. I'm not going to play a bunch of music and beg you to come down here. I'm not going to do any evangelistic tricks on you. It's between you and the Lord. If you need to repent of your sins and call on Jesus this hour, we invite you to do it. Just pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask by faith that you would change me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me. I ask by faith that you would wash me clean from the inside out. Lord, I thank you for your goodness and for your grace, for your love, for your mercy for meeting me here in this place today and for putting a chair at your table for me one day. Father, I'm so grateful for these who have made time in their day today to come and hear from your word. Father, I pray that you have blessed their hearts and their lives, and I pray that they will leave this place encouraged, knowing that you have a plan for them, a simple one, but an important one, that they would go and be your hands and feet this week, that they would intentionally bless three, that they would intentionally eat with three, that they would make the most of their time, every time, at the table. Father, help us not to miss the significance of, of the small things in life that make the biggest difference. Lord, I thank you for the heart of this church. I pray that you would bless these families and these marriages and all these here who love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for being a part of our online family and joining us for this message that God put on my heart. I pray that it blesses you. I want to ask you if you could just do three quick, simple, easy, free things for me right away. If you haven't already, number one, hit the subscribe button. Number two, hit the thumbs up or like button if you feel like this video, this sermon is worthy of that. And number three, if God blesses your heart with this message, leave an encouraging word. Just leave an encouraging comment or a thought down there in the comment section. We would appreciate that so much. Thank you for being a part of our family, for joining us uh, here for this message.